heard from enough people that this was something they wanted to um, have access to that then I, I turned it over to the Teaching Learning Communications Committee and the newly formed journal about teaching resources and they didn't hesitate to say they would take on the challenge. So um, this along with the website that you're gonna hear about are two of the very timely responsive efforts they've made so that we can feel like uh, our community of practice around teaching as a set of professionals, um, we can lean into it a little bit. And um, I look forward to hearing both some tips about how to do online instruction a little better, even though I've had my fingers in it a long time, I know I could be doing it better, but also to hear about some creative ideas about how we can make it a little bit easier for all of you, our members, um, to make these transitions, um, which we're all right in the heat of. So thanks for taking an hour out of your day to join us. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to um, this great task force who's put on this event for today. Thank you, Don. First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jason Bergtold. He's a professor in the Department of Agricultural Economics at Kansas State University. He teaches undergraduate and graduate classes on campus and online. He's the editor of the AEA publication on teaching, the Applied Economics and Teaching Resources Journal, and is a member of our AEA Task Force for Online Learning and Teaching Resources. His research interests include production economics, environmental economics, land use, and applied econometrics. So Jason, if you would please take over the screen and walk us through the website, we would much appreciate it. Okay, thank you, Mariah. So um, this is the web, um, I wanna start from the AAEA website in terms of, so we created a online learning and teaching resource portal. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, there's two kind of ways to get there. One is it's listed right here under my member benefits or just go to the membership page. It's right at the bottom. And if you click on that, you'll find our kind of the portal. So this was a response. This is a task force that includes myself, Mariah Emke, Rodney Jones, Kristen Kiesel, Don Tilmani. And we got together and tried to design working with Allison Sheets um, and Jessica Weimer at the AAEA office to um, try to bring together online resources that people have access to. And so, um, and in addition, try to organize events like the webinar and such that we're doing today. And so that's kind of what the, um, uh, port the portal was our first task and then reaching out to the webinar. And so we set up the portal. The portal is gonna have like, we have to, we'll try to, if we're doing events or anything like that, we'll have that listed in the announcements on the portal as those come out. We'll also, those should go out to the membership as well. Um, in terms of how the portal is set up, um, we have two major sections. The first one is general instructional resources and practice. So these we have some highlight videos, um, links to articles, and these will change as we go throughout the semester and across the summer as we continue. Um, but these are just some highlight videos and stuff. Um, if you have ideas to post there, like you find a great video, something, we even have one here that's a little on the humorous side, kind of, um, to be a little bit lighthearted a little bit too, to give you a smile, um, as well as other things that are coming out that are kind of really um, timely and helpful for instructors. Below that, um, so our first section is general instructional resources. We have what's called an accordion. And so we have these different sections um, in there. Um, I won't read through them, but you'll notice under each section, you'll usually have some notes or tips um, in there. Um, please feel free to email us to add to this information here. Also on some of these, um, I believe, um, like online assessment, um, you'll also find some links to articles um, or other documents that, cause, so this is general education for online education and remote teaching. And so um, we're trying to provide links to resources and stuff like that as well. At the bottom, we have provided some, we didn't wanna to go too crazy with it, but we did provide some links to university websites that have some pretty good online teaching websites as well. And I know most universities have, have these websites now, 
Um, and I know at Kansas State we do too. So this is kind of the first link was these general resources for instructional and practice. And then the other thing we really wanted to do was, and probably one of the primary objectives was to provide um, specific subject matter, actual online materials, lectures, videos, case studies, um, tools that can be used for online teaching to help enhance the experience and help instructors get off the ground quicker or integrate into their classroom without having to create everything from scratch. And so we did this by creating, um, we have these area specific um, kind of, and we've organized these by topic and what you'll find in here is different tools. So some are just links to articles. We, I did try to link the AETR articles. We are looking at other teaching journals to link those as well um, when we find them. Um, and so those will be growing. In addition, you'll notice, um, so under like agribusiness, food and marketing, we do have, here's access, Joe Parcell was kind enough to give us access to his textbook, online tech um, ebook, e which is free. Um, and so there's other ones, Don, um, Tilmani uh, provided us access to an online lecture along with slides and materials and there's uh, more have been posted. So um, you'll notice um, some of these topics are very thin in terms of um, resources and some have a lot of information there. And so one thing we're looking at is if you go to the top of our page, there's a submission form that says submit now. So if you're designing materials, you have materials. Um, these can be lectures, they can be games, they can be documents or exercises um, that have proven very useful for online teaching that you're developing that you think other people would have advantage for in their classroom, please submit them to us. Um, all you have to do is go to the Submit Now button and then you'll see a JOP form that's gonna ask for some information from you. Um, and then it's gonna ask for some basic information about what you're, um, what, what you're submitting to us. So we'd like a title, a brief description. You'll choose a subject area that um, it'll be um, included in. Um, if you have a video link or a link to materials, you can provide the link or you can upload those materials to us. And then what we do is we review those materials and then we try to get them posted within 48 hours of receiving those materials so they're accessible to the a to actually the general public not even aae and membership the one thing i will um i want to highlight is down here for all the materials we are bringing on i'm um i want to protect to make sure so we're doing two things to help out here um for authors who are submitting materials we're asking you to choose a creative Co commons license um, one, to provide some protection for those materials, but also you get the attribution for those materials for use in the classroom by other people. Um, and so we, we have different types of license. We chose three different licensing options um, that are described here. We are also emphasizing the licensing, op licensing options because we want to make sure people using the material off the website, they're giving attribution for that. Um, another thing we're doing that provides benefit to uploading material here is if you do go to this site, so say you want to access materials on um, Joe Parcell's book, it takes you to a form. So one of the things we're trying to collect is information of where the resources you, you for authors, we're trying to collect that information of where, um, who's downloading the resources and where they're being used. And so the idea for us is if an author requests, we can try to get that information back to them. Um, and so that's useful. Um, for their use, um, as well as for saying when you're putting up your pro promotion and tenure, as well as um, annual reviews. And so if you're generating scholarly material that's not necessarily a peer reviewed journal article, but is being used in classrooms um, at different land grants or different small universities or other departments or worldwide, we're trying to track that. Um, and so that's one thing we've built into the website. Another thing I will point out for the website is our plan for the website is to continue to have this up and dedicated to the online teaching forum. Um, 
for learning and teaching until the COVID-19 pandemic subsides. And then our idea is to transition this to, for AETR, to keep all these materials online and kind of keep the same format and open it up to all teaching materials that people want to upload. So this will become our online database down the road as well. So any questions from anyone? Is this members only? No, it is anyone who wants to um, post. So it's not restricted to members only. Okay, I missed. I thought you said it was behind the membership. No, no, it's not. It's public. Okay. It's under the membership um, benefits, but you do not have to sign in to um, to have access to the materials. It's open to everybody. Any other questions that anyone may have? There's a comment, will this site remain after the pandemic? Yes. Um, and so the idea here was for us is we're, we'll probably transition the site after the pandemic uh, uh, in terms of we'll keep the online teaching and resources. We'll probably retitle it a bit so it will not be only online but in class, so in-person instruction as well. Um, but I want to, or we'll have two sites, one for online and one for in class, because we want to create, we want this to become a database of actual teaching tools and um, kind of uh, instructor materials that can be used going into the future as well. So that's one of the goals of AETR as well. Jason? Yes. Uh, so, how does a submission to this online platform affect or does not affect future submissions to AETR? So, if I submit some teaching uh, notes and material, or like results of experiment that I want, that I'm planning on on polishing and send to AETR in the future, should I just go forward or wait and first submit to AETR or just submit both to to the to join the online here. platform? I mean, if you're submitting, I'm fine with you submitting here and submit to AETR. And then what we'll do, see if you want to keep it here, move it to the AETR. Because usually with an AETR article, you're going to have a little bit more in-depth discussion about it and results and stuff showing that that you might not have here for an online exercise or a game. Yeah, that's what so, I'm thinking. Just sound like a preview, a, a less polished version here, so to, to get more timely help to others. And then in the future, still submit something to ETR, a better version of it, but just uh, as long as one thing doesn't impact the other, of course. That's a, those are good questions and also things for us to maybe make the directions more explicit on, on the line as well. So thank you. At this time, I'll ask Jason to stop sharing his screen, and then we will move to having our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Emilio Morales from the University of New England in Australia. So he will start sharing his screen. That's Jason, right. I was going to say, Jason, can you stop sharing your screen? There we go. All right. Good job. Okay, I'll take a few minutes just to tell you all a little bit about Dr. Morales. I actually had the fortunate experience of getting to host him here at the University of Wyoming last year. And we were, although we were working on a research project together, I was really fascinated by his online class he developed. So I hope that you, you also find it to be a good resource as well and give you some inspiration and in sort of what can be a kind of strenuous time. But he's a senior lecturer at the, in agricultural economics at the University of New England in New South Wales, Australia. And he specializes in value change. Last year, he didn't just impress me, he impressed others as the recipient of the 2018 University of New England Business School Award for Teaching and Learning Innovation. Emilio has conducted research on consumer preferences and willingness to pay for agri-food products, 
And so he holds a PhD in economics from the University of New England in Australia and a master's degree in agricultural economics from the Chilean Catholic University. So he comes from us um, to, from Australia, but also has a rich Chilean background as well. So with that, um, I hope everyone enjoys the next 20 minutes or so. We will hear more about his teaching experience and what he's finding successful online. Thank you, Emilio. Thank you, Mariah. Hello, everyone. Well, first of all, I would like to thank Mariah and the Agriculture and Applied Economics Association for this opportunity to contribute uh, to this discussion presenting about my experience teaching online. Well, I am Emilio Morales, Senior Le Lecturer at the uh, University of New England in Armidale, Australia. So, well, this is my university. And, well, we are very proud that uh, we are one of the most prestigious universities in regional Australia, which has the advantage that we have uh, our students and on top of that, we have um, some of the usual friends that probably you know that we have in Australia. So, well, now you're probably asking yourself, where is Armidale in Australia? Because it's not, not a really famous place here. And well, I could say that Armidale, it's right there <laughs> between Sydney and Brisbane. And it's like uh, 500 kilometers away between the two of them. And it's a small town. Uh, we are like uh, 25,000 people, so pretty small. Hmm? Well, I have to say that 500 kilometers in Australia is not really big distance, but still uh, what I want to highlight is that um, in this context, online teaching represents an important opportunity for my university from long ago, yeah? because we have a big proportion of students that are not on campus, they are in big cities, and uh, somewhere else in Australia too, and also some other overseas. So, well, how is to teach online? And, uh, well, imagine that you enter in an empty lecture theater or one with uh, very few students, like this one that I put in the presentation. That was uh, my feeling when I started coordinating units at UNE. Well, we have not many students uh, that were on campus at that time and some uh, online. So, well, I was coming from a di different uh, background, uh, very traditional face-to-face. -face, and to me, online uh, teaching put me absolutely out of my comfort zone. And at the beginning, I also found it a bit strange experience. So I have questions in my mind if it really was um, a valid way of teaching. But today I could say definitely, yes, it is. And it is uh, definitely a different experience to interact with the screen than a person. But I found quickly that the students are there, even though you don't see them and you have probably a camera. Now, nowadays we are more used to, but I think that is our uh, experience today. Yeah? And if students are there, then I recommend you that uh, you could ask questions when you run online sessions. And you could do poses. Okay? Uh, so students that are watching even live or, or later on when you do recordings, they have time to think about certain concepts in a similar way that we run a, a physical session. And yeah, you notice that the students are there because they start asking why other students that uh, are in, in, the, in the theater, for example, were not answering some question on, or uh, they want clarifications on some points that I did. So definitely they are there and it takes some time to get used to talk to this uh, camera instead of people. But after a while, uh, it will come naturally. So, well, some tips for sessions that can be followed online that I, I noticed that you could divide the sessions to avoid very long ones and to avoid rushing because a student um, could get tired or distracted. Also, I have a big issue with uh, my this and here. Okay? This was a major thing because uh, students are not always able to see that point or what we are talking about and that is frustrating for them yeah? so sometimes when you mix on on campus and online you focus more on the on campus and forget about that so um 
even if you have cameras, sometimes the your your writings are not very clear. So what I suggest is that you could use the mouse or highlight something in your presentation and then make things friendlier. Um, I had the experience with a unit in econometrics a few years ago. And yeah, well, we generally in econometrics, we start with the formula, we write the formula and we explain things. But I noticed that probably a better strategy was to create a document, just draw down and then scan it and then create this PDF document when I was uh, highlighting the points that I want to discuss. So instead of writing, that was the traditional way I did that and the comments were very, very good. So my suggestion is find your ways to make your presentation friendlier. Well, nowadays we have the, the Zoom sessions that are available. So when you can use them, I mean, we didn't have this alternative a few years ago. And, and now it's great because on top of you being able to record the session, you also can ask questions, you receive some feedback uh, from students which is um, a very big advantage. But in my experience, students tend to be a bit shy uh, during online sessions. So doing like we saw a few minutes ago that we allow questions through the chat, it's a very good idea. So they could ask more questions in that way. And anyway, they will contact you later on, but uh, that create more discussion. And also I recommend you to ask them to turn on their cameras because otherwise they could get distracted in a similar way that they do on the lecture theater. So that could be uh, explored by you. So how can we improve the online uh, learning experience? Well, when I started, some colleagues just told me, okay, Emilio, you can just dump some material uh, in the class website. Uh, and then the students will dig out and find uh, what to study. And of course, that was not a, a very good uh, learning uh, experience for students uh, online. So, well, after a while, I started developing some material and quite a few. And then I received comments from senior colleagues that a good strategy will be to create uh, a map to guide the, the students. Because uh, I have different materials that uh, could help in terms of video or, or written material. So what uh, it will be good to guide the students somehow. So, well, I, I have the question, how could I guide these students? And will they enjoy it? So I have that big question in my mind. And I started with some instructions. And then I did like a flow chart, but I found that something was missing. And then I came out with this idea of the learning adventure. So, well, I will present today these two topics that, uh, that or units that I am uh, teaching this uh, class in economics for management, which is general economics and this risk uh, management in agribusiness. So I thought that well, it was uh, quite attractive and at least one person, that being me, will enjoy the class. So if that is the case, it might be the case that some students will enjoy it too. Yeah? And so far, most of the students have enjoyed it and a few have been just indifferent. So anyway, I think it's a positive outcome. So let's see what I, I did in my, my unit. So here I have, well, we use in my university Moodle. So, well, with the help of uh, uh, educational developers and some of the web designers, um, we create this map. So it's basically like a treasure map. Okay? And yeah, you could see that it's animated. So the idea is to catch the attention of students. And well, it has different sections. So here we have the introduction uh, topic, and then we go to macroeconomics all the way to macroeconomics until we have the last um, topic that uh, is when we found the treasure. So if we go to one of the topics, you will notice that, well, first of all, I, I put like a, 
like a message at the beginning, just to motivate the students. I say, well, let's start this adventure and I give like a welcome message. And then what are the learning outcomes that they will find? And at the end, I put the phrase like, yo ho ho, until we get the booty or treasure. So keep them uh, enthusiastic about the learning. And well, after that, I have to come with the real stuff that is uh, our topic notes that yeah, it's like traditional topic, uh, and uh, well, you could you could see that uh, we have uh, like a, like a normal uh, topic notes that we have in other units. So that's the uh, case. We have one lecture recording, so they could download it and go around because some of the my students uh, had to travel, so. We notice that they don't have the internet connection all the time, especially those that are in inland areas. Um, well, we have certain uh, review questions and their answers, obviously, the, uh, and I created in PDF so they could download it too. Um, the lecture notes, um, some of the answers to the uh, chapter of the textbook that we, we use for the unit, which is um, introductory economic economics and then I put a video library which I found that is very good because some students don't like much to to read so to have uh, that alternative that they could watch a short video in YouTube was pretty good and this by the way was a, an American professor that did some of this uh, that were uh, most of the students were very enthusiastic to see that. And uh, at the end, well, we allow the students to try to catch the treasure and then test their, their knowledge with this self-assessment. So the idea is that they could go to this multiple choice, but it's not uh, weighted on the overall uh, unit. So that is the, um, the main idea of this uh, unit. Of course, it has some general material and announcement and other things. And in the topic 11, something that I wanted to present is, well, I put the, again the message and the material. And at the end, I said, well, this is when we found the treasure. And I tried to relate the treasure with the nation treasury that was part of the unit. So somehow connect this learning adventure with, uh, with what they need to study. So they feel more enthusiastic. So that's what was my idea on this unit. And well, I tried to go to the other unit quickly that is uh, in agribusiness. This is risk management in agribusiness. And you could see that uh, I follow a similar approach, but adjusted uh, the Moodle side in this case uh, with the characteristics of uh, this unit. So you have uh, again an introduction topic, and then we go all the way until we have the. Um, our cattle that it's going to go on the metal chip. So again, I have the, the topic notes similarly and some of the uh, material and tutorials and of course the forums and the um, uh, video library again that was uh, developed so they could enjoy more time uh, with the unit. And at the end uh, of this, um, uh, adventure, if we go to the last topic, well, I try to stress the idea that in this topic, we have exchange rate risk. So we discuss about that. So we send our cattle and need to uh, cross the ocean. Generally, we, in Australia, we export cattle to Indonesia. So we will receive payment when the cattle arrives on the other side of, of the ocean. So in that way, I try to relate this adventure with the exchange rate risk, which was the objective for this unit. So I think this is uh, what I wanted to present. And um, well, if we come back to the, um, to the presentation, well, I say, well, that's part of the, what we have as a research in, in the Moodle or the class website, but also we have to add the value. And I asked uh, questions to myself generally, what uh, might my online students potentially need or appreciate? Yeah. So I recommend you to, first of all, know who they are, 
because some of them are working and studying, others are mom with kids at home. I think at the moment everyone is at home, but in the future that is going to change and then they will they will travel, they will be working. So you could tailor the material according to their time. Uh, some, some of them are time poor, so uh, we need to consider that. Uh, so they could download, they could study on their way to work and among other alternatives. Also, I recommend you to have a, some uh, like a specific forum that it's more informal so they could chat informally and it's very good because some of them are in the same area of the or, or in a state for example some in brisbane where and they could meet and discuss so it's good anyway you need to i recommend you to monitor uh, that forum because um, you know some sometimes issues could ar arise and not everyone is nice all the time hmm? All the thing that is uh, that I found useful it's uh, to provide examples and probably uh, release them gradually. So you allow students to to discuss, to interact with them, and then you keep these forums alive. So it's important that they support, they feel your support. So you provide uh, replies on a timely manner. But also you need to allow students to interact between them too. And I found that really difficult because I know we want to do things the best way possible and try to answer. And sometimes we rush a little bit to answer some questions, but that might discourage uh, students' interaction. So um, I found that uh, it's difficult, but we need to keep that balance. Um, but if something goes wrong or they, they discuss and they, they move out of track, you need to jump in and then uh, guide them back to the to the right point. So another thing that I found uh, really useful is to create these Zoom discussions. So you could also offer some sessions to review a specific concept or prepare for an assessment. And generally, they are very popular among the students. And if you record, um, because some students could have issues to attend or they want to check uh, more than once or repeat and go over and over again on the recording, um, you could see how they concentrate on certain parts. I know that some colleagues are not very positive on recording this material for the students. We think that we give too much to them. But uh, I, I do for my units and the university here has a system that allows you to, to check the reviews and how many views they have and what are the hotspots. And I got absolutely impressed because some students go over and over again on certain uh, topics. Also, um, I found that it's an excellent evidence that we are doing our job and some students are not doing their job because uh, it's clear that it's, it has been discussed and it's clear where you discuss that point. So if someone comes with those questions, you could quickly spot and say, uh, okay, you need to review this, this recording and then come back. And also between some students that happened. And well, something that I was not told, but uh, I noticed over time is that we need to set up certain rules and expectations. I mean, in my view, one of the best things that we could do is to set up a, a unit information document. Um, here at the university, I don't know why some educational developers love to spread the information um, all oh around the, the Moodle site, oh our class website, and that um, uh, obviously confuses students, they could miss some information. So with this uh, unit information document that generally I create a PDF and then upload it, all the rules are set there, everyone knows. And if someone comes with a question, uh, generally I say, yeah, this is the case, check page X in the uh, um, unit information document. So it's also important that you are the moderator. So uh, you are there to help, but it's their responsibility. Respect to kindness and respect. We take this for granted, but uh, it's not uh, happening all the time. I don't know, some students, um, I have the feeling that they post or send messages 
without thinking carefully that another human being with feelings is going to read that. And it's not only for us, also between students. So in some cases, I had to delete certain comments uh, from the post in Moodle and then contact a student and say, you, you can't do this uh, sort of comment because they are offensive to other students or sometimes they're not very respectful full towards me. So what I, I believe is that this affect interactions in Moodle and potentially could discourage participation. So it's not, not good. And if something is going wrong, it's better to, to contact that person or send an announcement. Sometimes it's better to talk to everyone so no one feels really touched about this, but um, it's better to touch it. And other thing that I found uh, really important is to set up a period of expected reply. So we are they, there to help them, but we are not their slaves. So we are not available 24 seven to, <laughs> to answer questions. So uh, generally it's a good practice to say, we will reply within 48 hours, for example. We have that, um, that rule I applied. Um, some colleagues set up uh, certain days and a specific times to reply. Yeah? That's their, their alternative. In my case, I do as much as I can daily, but I have limits. Sometimes I am coordinating uh, two units and teaching another one. So three units uh, and obviously our time it's constrained. So sometimes it's impossible to reply all questions in one day. So you continue the next one. And also some colleagues do not uh, reply over weekends. It's a sensitive topic, I know, but I do. Hmm? But if you do it, I recommend you to anyway, you set certain rules. Hmm? So for example, I said that Sundays are day that I spend with my family and because of uh, my religion, uh, it's a day that I don't work. So I put that, that rule and I said, I will reply either Saturday or I will go to Monday. And so far with that personal rule, no one has had issues. So that's my suggestion to you. I know this is very scary for everyone. Um, the online exams that I think is the future and some potential strategies. Well, this is a big push that was made by the virus. My university was uh, working on this. Um, and with, uh, the idea is that we have this online exam that are invigilated remotely by Proctor U. Uh, but in economics, we say, no, we have, uh, we ask the students to do some equations and draw diagrams. So uh, we, that's not possible, so we cannot use that. But I predicted that this COVID-19 situation could escalate. So I explore some alternatives and well, one of my, colleagues, that is my friend, was very angry with me because I broke the cartel and I talk about the online exam. But um, a, a few weeks uh, after I discussed, the um, university made all, all exams online compulsory for all units. So my friend was my best friend again. Because we need to put uh, our contribution to this uh, very bad situation that we are living these days. So well, going beyond that uh, scare that we might have, some strategies that we discuss is that, um, for example, you could set up um, a pool of question per question. So that means not all exam will be the same and that reduce probably the, their capacity to, to do some cheating. Also, students, because they need to do some working and calculations, they, they could work on a piece of paper and then take a picture and upload those picture. And then I know what you're thinking about. They're going to share that, that material. But if we provide a particular template where the student include the, the student name and number uh, on a watermark, if some of these copies are around, you know who is the, the owner of that copy and who is sharing that. And also something that we discuss is the possibility that the examiner could provide like a certain code. So in that way, they don't know that code uh, in advance. So that must be the copy that they work during the exam period. 
So that's, uh, those are some strategies that you might consider. And obviously we will need to reassess next year to see how things are going. Um, well, this, uh, I guess in this, all, after all this situation with the COVID-19 experience, this might be the way of the universities in the future, which is less physical and more electronic and in the internet. Um, well, these are the references that I use uh, in my presentation. And I want to uh, finish this presentation with a huge thanks and recognition to the staff that works in the health system because they raised, raised their lives to save our lives. So we are doing our part. We try to contribute, but what they're doing, it's absolutely remarkable. So big thanks to them. And well, if anyone has questions, you can contact me by email and here are my details. So you can contact me anytime. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emilio. That was really nice to hear your experience. And just for our American listeners, I think I'll do one translation from Australian English to US English, and that is a unit is a class or a course here. Um, and otherwise, I think hopefully most of it was, was clear around the world. So now I'm excited to introduce our panel members. In addition to Emilio and Jason, which we've already heard from, I'm pleased to introduce a, a non-economist who we have with us, Dr. Simon Ringsmith from um, Oklahoma State University. He is an educational uh, curriculum development expert. He works there in the Institute for Teaching and Learning. He and his colleagues work with faculty across their campus to help improve their teaching and their methods for one-on-one -on -one course feedbacks through one-on-one -on -one course feedback sessions, workshops, classes, and long-term improvement projects. Simon also teaches the Preparing Online Instructors class. It's a six-week class in which faculty learn about online instruction by becoming students in an online class. Hundreds of individuals have gone through this course over the past seven years, and it is now a requirement of many departments whose faculty want to teach online. So he has developed uh, not only expertise in how to um, teach online, but also how to teach teachers to teach online. So we're looking forward to having him. Welcome, Simon. Yeah, good afternoon. It's good to be here. Good. Then we also have Dr. Kristen Kiesel, who's a member of the fa a faculty member at the Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics at UC Davis. She is currently serving as a community engaged learning fellow and is chair of AAEA's teaching and learning communication section, our, our section dedicated to teaching in the in the profession. She's actively involved in her department's undergraduate managerial economics major, teaching a variety of classes, including managerial marketing and introduction to behavioral economics. And her research focuses on economics of food consumption with an emphasis on information effects. So thank you, Kristen, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Rodney Jones. He shares and has been an outgoing um, chair of the teaching, learning, and communication section with Dr. Kiesel. He's also a member of the AETR editorial board and a member of this um, online task force. He's currently the farm credit professor of agricultural economics at um, the Oklahoma State University. His primary teaching is in the areas of agricultural finance, management, and basic economics. He has an active extension program focused on farm and man agribusiness management, and his recent publications inform a broad range of applied economic issues ranging from cow-calf herd health to agricultural law. So welcome, Rodney. Thank you, it's good to be here. All right. So now is the opportunity. I am. Um, I think what I will do is, for the most part, silence myself and then let people either ask questions through the chat box or through the um, through if you want to turn on your microphone or um, online uh, through through Zoom 
ver verbally, go ahead and we will see, let the, the panel respond to questions that you may have after listening to uh, Dr. Morales's presentation and just things that are challenging to you right now if you're in the middle of transitioning to online course development. Mariah, this is Rodney, and I might start out by just throwing out a question to uh, my friend and colleague, Simon, because uh, I know Simon's been getting a lot of uh, questions via email or perhaps phone calls uh, as we have uh, transitioned to online uh, teaching here at Oklahoma State University. We're now at the end of our third week following spring break. Uh, and I just kind of throw out the question to Simon, uh, what kinds of questions are you getting from faculty uh, in your role with ITLE, uh, what are the most common challenges uh, that you're hearing uh, from faculty uh, across the university? It's a good question, Rodney, and I appreciate you asking. Um, so just as a, a little bit other of background, I also am a faculty member. I teach at the Spear School of Business, and I've been teaching there for about six years. And uh, so I see all sides of the equation. I'm, I'm a faculty member. I teach faculty members in my preparing line instructors class, but I'm also in the support role. Um, I'm, I'm part of the Canvas support team on campus as well. Um, so we see a lot of different types of, of issues. And right now what we're seeing is, uh, honestly, a lot of people are just struggling to learn to use the LMS. And we have people thrust into this online teaching environment who've uh, almost never logged into Canvas. And, uh, and I'm seeing some head shaking because it seems like that's, maybe that's not unique to our university. And the, I, I hear the word intuitive thrown around a lot. And people say, uh, oh, this iPhone, it's so intuitive, or this, this software is so intuitive. And what we're finding is that intuitive means different things to different people. And uh, I, we have Canvas, and um, I, I don't think the, the learning management system, uh, I think it makes a lot of sense for some people, but to a lot of people who are just trying to learn the basics, it's really confusing. And I think that goes for any LMS system. And so my goal would be to get people to where Emilio is talking about, where we need to have empathy for our students, we need to guide students through our course, we need to use discussion boards, all those things that Emilio was talking about, and yet, we have a whole contingent of people that they're down, they're just, they can't even log on to the system. <laughs> so we're seeing this big divide in terms of skill level. And it would be uh, really nice if we could get everyone to the point where we really can have these campus wide discussions about engaging learners and, and um, assessing students and designing online assignments. But we're seeing a lot of people who just, they can't even log into the system. And so, um, it's a challenge for us, but it's, people are up optimistic and we're learning to deal with it. So hope, I don't know if that answers your question exactly, Rodney, but. Yeah, that was the kind of thing I was, uh, I was looking for. Uh, uh, and I'd welcome any other comments. Uh, uh, and here in a few minutes, uh, maybe I'll share my biggest challenge uh, as I've transitioned to this online environment over the last three weeks. But if anybody else on the panel or, or in the question group uh, has something to share, uh, uh, I'd welcome that first. We, we would welcome that first. I, I wanted to add and then maybe also respond to a question that we have received in the, in the chat button. And first of all, thank Simon for all of the uh, small videos he created, um, similar to what he described. We have a support group within our faculty and, and some of it and a lot of it was um, teaching and helping uh, faculty with uh, using all the, the features on Canvas. And I have sent uh, Simon's videos uh, and, uh, and the site um, to a number of, of my colleagues to say, here are quick videos that you can check. They were very helpful. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much. I wanted to respond to the question that we got uh, from Wu Yang, and that is the question of uh, creating new assignments and new ways of engagement to allow students to, to be guided through, through the class, as Emilio said. Um, but also figuring out how to, to balance being flexible for everybody's concern. Uh, so one thing that, that I found helpful uh, was setting up uh, uh, quizzes. I, I still do live lectures um, on Zoom, but I have pre-lecture quizzes that try to assess whether the students did the reading. And then I also have post-lecture quizzes. 
and I try to have the pre-lecture quizzes available 24 hours so that it gives students uh, a lot of uh, room um, in their time frame to add uh, to access them and then post lecture quizzes are open 48 hours um, so to really try to address some of those issues uh, and then also um, drop some of those quizzes so that um, if there are any issues arising so that you don't have to accuse them uh, specifically um, so out of the 17 total quizzes um, I allow them to drop three of their lowest scores so add some flexibility so that you have less uh, of these questions where you have to deal with um, excuses uh, of students and I found that relatively helpful. Uh, and in addition to creating a small video to walk them through where to find the assignments um, and, and, and how to submit them. So maybe that, that helps with the question that, that we've gotten in the, in the chat box. I want to add to Christine too because uh, at my university, we try to follow that approach. So we have some of these online uh, tests or quizzes that are open for 24 hour or 48, depending on the case. If the students work remotely and in, in inland areas, generally that's a good strategy. And in terms of the lectures, uh, I know that not all of them attend to, to the online or, or even physically. Um, for different reasons, they are busy or they just don't, don't feel like. But um, our approach that we have followed with some colleagues is we do the recording, we provide the material, and at the end of the day, it's their responsibility to, to check the material. And if they don't do it, well, at least we, we did our part, and then it's, it's time for, for them to, to have their responsibility. So that's, that's our approach. And, and if, if I might, oh, go ahead, Christian. If, if I may add, um, I do do uh, the, the live lectures and I um, use the student response software to incentivize the live lectures, but then I also have the recordings available to them um, as well as the, the lecture slides. And I provide the lecture slides in kind of an outline form so that they can take notes on the lecture slides as well. So providing the material in a, in a number of different ways to allow the students to choose um, which setting of accessing the material works best for them uh, is something that, that I found in explaining that you have those different settings. Yeah, um, if uh, just to piggyback on what Kristen said and to answer um, Wu Yang's question from my perspective a little bit, we've, um, we really stress the importance of something that Amelia mentioned, which is frequent low stakes quizzes. And not only as a matter, uh, as an issue of, of uh, engaging or uh, assessing students um, throughout the semester as formative assessment, but also as a, a way to engage students. And if, if, um, if we do say discussion board posts and we say, well, we want our students to, I want my students to log in and, and post on the discussion board. And, and uh, we notice that most discussion drops off after the, the second or third week. Um, that's not enough incentive uh, for students, or maybe they'll log in just to post the bare minimum. But if we give them a low stakes quizzes every week throughout the semester, uh, it's a great way to, to help them recall that information. It's a good formative assessment. Um, but it also serves as that little carrot and stick approach where it gives them um, a reason to log in at least once a week. They got to log in to take that quiz. And um, that approach has been quite successful with a lot of instructors to, to migrate from, uh, even away from larger assessments like a final or a midterm, um, but in using projects or something else to demonstrate learning, um, but uh, uh, using that, that uh, frequent low stakes quizzes has many benefits. Um, as, and one of those is um, um, engaging students. And I also, um, I'll stop talking about this. We've had a lot of people call and request analytics. So they wanna know, um, how, how can I tell if my students are viewing the video? How can I tell if my students are watching lecture? How can I tell if my students are viewing, I've got PDFs. I wanna know if my students are watching, uh, look, looking at my PDFs. And they want data and they want reports. So like an Excel spreadsheet, I need to see student names and a list of assignments and all the numbers that show who's logging in and when. And I don't find those all that helpful. That's not actionable data. To me, if you're giving frequent low stakes quizzes or some other type of assessment, that's the metric that's gonna tell you if your students are learning the material. You can look at a spreadsheet and tell if they've clicked on a video. 
but that won't tell you if they've watched it or if they've understood the concept. If you give them some sort of assessment, some formative assessment along the way, that's going to tell you more than numbers on a spreadsheet. So anyway, that I'm going to take a sip of water and let others chime in now. I, I want to add to what Simon said that we, we have some colleagues that uh, also introduced that chat discussions in forums and when they post and but um i follow a similar approach that the one that you said uh, simon that you have certain assessment and in that way you know if they they engage or not and in terms of the recordings i i generally don't don't check that much what each individual student is doing um, generally, I, I check the cohort, but I remember uh, last year, in fact, one student said, Emilio, I check all the recordings, everything, I don't, and I don't understand anything. So I found that very strange because I say, how this person cannot understand, uh, not just a scene. So I went and I discussed with our ed developers, and there is a way that we could identify if the students have been watching the videos, and of course, she didn't watch any of them. So I said, look at our records, demonstrate that you haven't checked anything. So please check them and then you can come back. So I think that's another advantage of the recordings. And generally we use that only as a backup to support uh, what we are saying, but it's not a way to assess them. Okay? So just, just to add on that, Simon. Thank you all. I appreciate that. Thank you. I, I thought I might chime back in. This is Rodney. I thought I might chime back in and 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 just share my biggest disaster over the last three weeks. Uh, I teach three classes. One of them is an intro to Ag Econ class. So the assessment is very much uh, multiple choice uh, questions, just kind of a low level of introduction to the concepts. Uh, and I've always used weekly small quizzes in that class uh, ever since I've started teaching that class several years ago. Uh, I've always done a, a small stakes weekly assessment and done that in an online environment, uh, al along with about uh, three uh, high stakes, more midterm exam type uh, assessment mechanisms throughout the semester. And I found that class very easy to migrate to the online environment for the, for the high stakes assessment. Uh, I just implemented some of the practices that I had learned uh, from Simon and others. I built a question bank and did some random draws on some questions. I randomized the answers, uh, set a time limit that they had it available. Uh, and, and actually that, that assessment went pretty well here a week or so ago. Uh, but then I also teach uh, junior and senior level classes. And I've thought for the last several years that I was doing a pretty good job of getting to uh, a higher level uh, of learning, uh, actually getting students to the point where they could uh, implement some, some pretty high level finance skills. Um, but uh, when I was in a face-to-face -face environment, I would give short answer uh, type tests, maybe maybe 25 or 30 questions uh, worth three or four points a piece, uh, just a sentence or two answer, maybe a few simple problems that they had to uh, work. And when I went to an online environment, uh, I was kind of thrust into giving uh, uh, my midterm here a week and a half ago. So most of the material that we had covered uh, was prior to uh, moving to an online environment. It was still back from the face-to-face -face version of the class, but I decided to try something very different with my assessment and try kind of a project type assessment where they had to go out and kind of design some, uh, some example finance problems on their own uh, and come up with some answers and turn it in. Uh, and, uh, and what I found out is uh, that historically, I probably have not been getting to nearly as high of a level of comprehension of the material uh, as I thought I was getting to because uh, uh, they just were not not uh, very uh, well prepared or capable uh, of getting to that higher level of actually implementing the concepts. So uh, I'm trying to deal with that now, but, uh, but it's been a real learning experience 
because I thought I was getting to a higher level of, of learning uh, in previous semesters, and I'm not sure that I really was. Um, I see Thank that. You for sure. Thank you. Um, uh, I see we have another question in our uh, chat box about projects. Uh, yeah. out and maybe other people can uh, jump in. Um, my class on, on marketing that I teach historically has group project and I um, have continued them in the online setting. Um, in addition to this low, low stakes quizzes, I also implemented uh, a reflection exercise at the end of each week where, where students for a small incentive uh, submit a reflection on that week. That, that is a little bit time consuming. It's limited to 200 words, but it uh, actually allows you to have a conversation with your students. Uh, and what I've seen on the reflections is anxiety around um, how to uh, uh, execute the group projects. Um, I uh, posted some tips about the group projects. We have some intermediate deadlines, uh, tips in using the collaboration tool um, on Canvas, as well as setting up uh, small Zoom meetings. And, and I kind of uh, sample that in, in our classes and our sections by using the breakout room feature on Zoom. If, if some of you have used that to, to try to get students to talk to each other in a way that um, we also hear, heard in the talk to make sure that they not just talk to me, but to each other. And, and I will continue to monitor uh, some of that. But um, my view is that having the group project allows them to have still a, a sense of community and interaction with each other. Um, so it's more about uh, assur uh, assuring people that, that you will be there to help uh, monitor uh, and provide uh, a frequent check-in uh, on their projects. Yeah, I just, just want to, oh. no, no, go ahead. Just to add on that, uh, well, here we also have uh, some units with um, with projects, and so I, I had that that experience. And what we did was to um, to create this like Zoom at that time was Adobe Connect, but it's a similar idea. So we we had that option per group, but um, also I noticed that uh, some students say, no, I prefer to use the um, the Skype. So between them, they have the Skype, and I noticed that um, the problems that arise in the group projects online are similar to those like on campus physically. So some students are like free riders and don't collaborate, but that happen online or on campus anyway. So mm -hmm. generally using the, the Skype, they were quite fine. Or the other tool that was embedded in our Moodle site, our class website, that was our experience. Yeah, I've been, uh, I've, I've been having um, a lot of success with allowing my students to do group projects and decide on their own method of meeting. And I survey them every week and I ask them um, uh, in, in their group progress report they have to fill out, I, I say, how do you meet? And I, I'm looking at their responses right now. Um, about half this week met on Discord. Um, a couple met on GroupMe. Um, someone just did texting back and forth. Last week was kind of the same. They used FaceTime, Discord, um, the conferencing tool built into Canvas. And so um, I, you know, I don't have data to say, like to draw general conclusions, but just in my experience, um, the, the students actually have gravitated quite well towards group work and online environment. And they just turned in a major assignment last Friday that they had to complete uh, after the shift to online. And they did a great job. I didn't see any drop in quality compared to their face-to-face -face group work. Um, so I think the students are, you know, I can't extrapolate like just from one data set, but I, my sense is that students are a lot more familiar with online collaboration, especially in smaller, tighter knit groups than I was at their age, certainly. Um, and even uh, compared to what I am today, I, I think for a lot of students, they're used to uh, meeting virtually in various ways. And it, it, where we run into some roadblocks is if we say you have to use this platform, you have to use Zoom, you have to use uh, Google Hangouts or whatever. And then we have students who say, well, no, I want to use this other platform. Um, so if we give them a little bit of freedom, if, if we're focused on the results of their group collaboration rather than the method of their group collaboration, uh, it tends to lead to some pretty good outcomes. Uh, 
I want to thank all our panelists. We're getting close to the end here um, and have gone slightly over an hour. Uh, and uh, just, I think this was a nice uh, first effort. I've already seen a suggestion maybe for some more webinars later through this year. It'll be interesting too to see how, how our, our world um, transitions through this time. So, but thank you so much for your time and thanks for your participation. I'm gonna stop the recording now. And if anybody wants to sort of hang out and ask a few more questions, then there's time to do that. Thanks, Mariah. Thank you, Mariah. Yeah.